The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Today, let's take a trip into the friend zone. That's right, we're going to be talking about the Care Bears movie. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we are here to talk about the original Care Bears movie. And uh, the friend zone, of course, is Carolot. If you if you didn't get that, Marisha. Yes, but there was also a forest of feelings. Forest of feelings was a polycommune. That was a little odd <laughs> that we we delved into a polycommune in this. We we go we go quite a few places. Do you want to start us out with a basic plot synopsis? Okay. Well, there's kind of two plots going on here. There's the plot with Kim and Jason, who are two children who are jaded and bitter after their parents <laughs> died and they never want to love anyone again. And then there's Nicholas, who never had any friends, and he gets seduced by an evil occult book to cause everyone else to not be friends with each other either. And Kim and Jason and the Care Bears, eventually their stories meet up and they have to stop Nicholas and the evil book. And they all live happily ever after. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that covers it, though. I do want to uh, uh, talk about a couple of points <laughs> that you bring up there. But first, let's go to our what the fuck moments. I'll go ahead and start us out here. There is an absolutely unnecessary star traffic cop in Carolot. There's also modular lollipop machinery. Tenderheart is forced to fillet a fat man. Allegedly. <laughs> it's implied. It's totally implied. And no magical powers? Just yell really loudly and that'll defeat the bad guys. And they crucified a star to be a boat. Really, the stars are... They're the heroes of this story. They're the proletariat, basically. They are due for an uprising. Maybe so. It looked pretty happy with what it was doing, though. I guess, but it was like a learned hopelessness, I think. <laughs> Perhaps. I thought the vehicles in the in the show were pretty cool, actually. There, were, there was that star boat, and then before that, what was it? The rainbow rider that had the wheel, the, like one wheel that was a huge rainbow. That was cool. Yeah, so technically the rainbow rider was a second vehicle. I said that the star cop was unnecessary because we had a star cop and one car, but then we did also have the rainbow rider. Maybe it's more of a bicycle, though. Or a motorcycle. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like they were in any. I, I mean, unless something crazy is going on and it gets wrecked, like happens in the movie, it doesn't seem like they're in any danger of careening into one another. I mean, they have all of Carolot. Right. And 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 two vehicles. They they should be able to get around uh, uh, without a traffic cop. Mm -hmm. That is just pure enslavement. There's a lot to be said about the hierarchy in Carolot, but first I want to bring up a point that you mentioned in your plot synopsis, which I thought was interesting. Kim and Jason, the two kids who the bears bring back into the light, if you will, you immediately assume that their parents were dead, but they never say that in the movie. They say that their loved ones had gone away or that they had stopped loving them or whatever. Oh, I guess what I got from that was that their parents died. And so they were like, we're never going to love anyone again because no matter who you love, they always go away. I think it's meant to be that they died. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason, the writers or producers somewhere along the way were like, oh, saying died is too strong. Let's pull it back. Mm. But but then I think it ends up being creepier because it just it makes it seem as if their parents just got tired of them and left one day. Yeah, and that's possible. And that, I mean, it would explain a little bit more about why they're so bitter. Right. Instead of just sad. Although, to be fair, they don't stay bitter long. That's true. The bears, which this is a trend we have, uh, bears that want to be our friends. Yeah, yeah, it happened in the Pocahontas movie too, although it was a little creepier in that one. At least the Care Bears are, <laughs> uh, they're a little more friendly seeming and less creepy. Though, again, this teaches the lesson that it's okay to go off with a stranger if they say they want to be your friend. That's 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 true. Yeah, there are a couple little uh, lessons in here that, that really shouldn't be moral lessons, I don't think. Like at the very end, Nicholas, for example, after he goes through with this whole plan to make everybody not care about each other anymore, and in the end, he gets rewarded by getting many, many friends and his name to be first billed with the magic show that he's in and stuff. Like that, he, there are no negative consequences for his actions. Yeah, he seemed to uh, not only did the great fettuccine which oh my god that same joke from ghostbusters
Ghostbusters 2. It's so, it's like, it's ne- it was never funny. It was never, ever funny. And the fact that now I know that <laughs> Ghostbusters 2 cribbed it from Care Bears <laughs> makes me a little angrier. But yeah, it's, everybody's very forgiving at the end. It's like, oh, hey, you know, you're still kind of a screw up, but why don't you just be the star and everything's better? And also it's like, to me, so... The reason that I wanted to do this film is because I remember seeing this in the theater as a kid. And at the time, I thought it was way more fucked up than it actually, like, is here. I mean, this is it's pretty messed up for a kid's movie. But um, at the time, there were a lot of things that I remember about it that now, rewatching it, I realize I was completely and totally inferring a lot more than actually happened. Like possibly the fellatio scene right but at at the time i remember feeling while i was watching it this is going to be such a horrible ending because they're going to have to kill this kid Mm. i i was convinced that they were going to have to murder nicholas and deal with the repercussions and then the fact that they don't doesn't stick in my mind the fact that there was a child who was uh, swayed to the dark side in a fairly convincing Star Wars-esque manner, I guess. That was what stuck in my mind. I also was convinced that Braveheart died to save everyone. I don't I don't know where that came from. Possibly C.S. Lewis. Yeah, he, he mostly just helps out at the end by making a lot of noise with the others that don't have magical powers. I know that for me, having a lot of barnyard animals bleeding at me, that would not cause me to care. But the thing about Nicholas is, it's like, why do they want to be his friend? You know? I And Kim and Jason, why do they want to be their friend? Like, it seems to me that a, a good moral to teach a child is that you get friends when you are uh, worth being a friend to. That would kind of go against the message of the Care Bears, though, which is that everyone deserves caring and everyone deserves to be loved and all that, I guess. Is that what the message is? Because well, to me, it's like, hey, are, are you happy? You will never see a magical bear. <laughs> I guess so. I did notice that with the Care Bears, their political drive, that like as a as a community, like they're on this war against apathy, and and like that's their that's their mission in the world is to make sure that apathy doesn't take over the entire world. And so, I mean, you you could say that that's that's the point of them. They're socialists. Uh oh. Carolot was obviously a socialist compound, and uh, Forest of Feelings was obviously a, a poly commune. Feelings can mean more than one thing, you know? Oh, there are many types of feelings in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I think their framing device in here got a little out of hand. What do you think? Because essentially this entire thing is a grown Nicholas, who we don't know it's Nicholas until the end, but a grown Nicholas telling the story to his 74 children. Right, why do they have so many children? And the kids all call them like Mr. and Mrs. Wigglybump or whatever. It's Cherrywoods. They also call each other Mr. and Mrs. Cherrywood, though, like the, the married couple, so... That's true, but I, I kind of got the feeling that maybe they were a foster home. Yeah, but they never mention it or explain it or or anything. Yeah. There was obviously a whole other story layer with that framing device that that maybe got left on the cutting room floor or something. Yeah, I guess so. Either they're Mormons or <laughs> they um, uh, or they're a foster family home, but they have tons of children. And Nicholas is telling this story, and then it's like you have to imagine, even though we don't hear his narration very much, that he's like. So anyway, kids, then the oversexualized demon book corrupted the young boy. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, Nicholas, why are you, why are you telling us? But of course, he, um, the first thing that he does, like on screen, is tell them to dream of clowns, and I screamed, at it, I screamed at it, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not what you want them to dream about. I promise. Not, not at all. No, unless you you hate the children, I guess, which is possible. Mm. I I hate a lot of children, so yeah. Uh, we had those dopamine uh, enhanced opening credits. What the fuck was? Oh my god, that Carolot song. Yeah, well, you know all the music in the movie. I actually I I thought it was pretty decent. I liked the songs. I appreciated the fact that uh, the music tried different genres. You know, it was never just one genre over and over again. It would try to go different places and try to set different moods. Like, we had kind of a Jimmy Durante thing at one point. We had um, uh, the kind of tripartite, 
let's talk about the forest of feelings versus earth versus uh, whatever, you know, and, and it's like, I, I did appreciate that, but the, oh my God, those opening credits, Carol King or whatever, it was a bad day for her. <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> And then they come back at the end. Oh, what was your favorite bear? Oh, let's see. Uh, you know, they all kind of blend together for me a little bit. Uh, really? I, I, you know, <laughs> a little bit. You know, like, you know, like emotions themselves. They're all kind of like they're all like in in uh, that, that inter- was sarcasm in, interlocked with each other. Yeah, I know. I. Uh, <laughs> I liked Grumpy Bear mostly because, like, as I was watching the movie, I could kind of relate a little bit. Grumpy Bear was the one working with the with the computer, which I think was was you you know like he reacted pretty well to those children that uh, or the little baby bears that messed everything up and accidentally activated the Stargate. Yeah, teleported the human children into this forbidden Carolot zone that they were never supposed to go in the first place. I mean, for being grumpy, he 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 reacted pretty well. I was impressed. Yeah, I, I Grumpy Bear, I I didn't catch this uh as a child, I don't think, but Grumpy Bear obviously still cared about everybody and was okay with being part of the group. I mean, he wasn't quite like Eeyore level. Yeah, yeah. Although they said that he never complained, which I thought was a little strange. Like, yeah. oh, if you're grumpy, <laughs> that should be your role. You you would think, yeah, like he just he just bitches, he doesn't complain. Like somehow there's there's some sort of fine line that we're not seeing. Yeah, I suppose so. Speaking of the children getting teleported to this uh, this magical forbidden place, they didn't express any shock at meeting these bears. They didn't express like a huge amount of surprise at uh, being transported to Carolot. In fact, they they don't express shock about these talking animals at all until they meet the monkey in the forest of feelings, and then they're like, "It's a talking monkey! Oh my word!" <laughs> Yeah, there. I I guess this is a good enough place as any to bring up the main point that I wanted to talk about here, which is let's discuss the theology uh, going on here. That would be interesting. Did you notice the different realms, like at Carolot, mm-hmm. Forest of Feelings, Earth? Like they definitely seem to me like analogs to like different like spiritual planes or whatever. Yeah, this was very similar to uh, uh, Dante's Inferno, uh, except I guess this would be more Dante's Paradiso. Uh, you know, it's we had the different kind of layers of everything. And the reason that I think they are um, not surprised by the Care Bears is that Carolot is fairly obviously meant to be heaven, right? Uh, yeah, there's clouds everywhere, rainbows, and like it's definitely a heavenly place, yeah. And they they act to make people care i mean the the care bears are angels right and so that's the way that i felt about it that the bears weren't surprising to the children because they're essentially angels in this universe and there are probably tales of angels they're in the bible i guess i mean i don't you know it's i don't know well who knows but but the their opposite though is this is this occult book that's clearly like demonic like it it speaks to this child and corrupts him and uses runes and spells and everything like there i mean that's certainly part of the theology as well although i do find it a little bit disheartening like that the act of victory in this movie is the act of uh, closing and locking a book you know yeah. you know so so i thought that was an interesting aspect as well it's a very anti-female anti-book movie yeah well don't listen to women. They will steer you down the wrong path. You think just because the villain was a woman, you think it's anti-woman? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> That's an interesting way to see it. So I'm just going to go with that because <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any arguments for or against it, but yeah. it, was, it was a woman and she was creepy because she was aggressive and blah, 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 blah. I thought she was yeah. an awesome villain. I'm, yeah, I, she I was, she I mean, was cool. she she worked well as a villain. Mm-hmm. I mean, and this is, the thing about this movie that is pretty intense is that, like, literally we see heaven crumbling to pieces from what's going on here, which, I heaven must just not be made very well, because we find out through the movie that he's stopped, like, one village from caring, 
And, you know, it's like, so heaven is like literally falling apart because like a couple thousand people stopped caring. Like that's Maybe really shocking. They're a localized heaven and like <laughs> there's there's like a bigger version somewhere else. Oh, I like that. Like maybe Forest of Feelings was like Czechoslovakia's heaven or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and and like the Care Bears are over, say, Romania and Central Park or whatever. Like that's, yeah, okay. I like that. Centralized heavens, the nine rings, you know, like there there are more rings. Like that's, I took a quick peek at Care Bears 2 and that's where like the horses get introduced and like all sorts of. There's horses? Yeah, they're, 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 they have manes anyway. I assume they're horses. Yeah, all, even more sorts of weird shit gets introduced, and so it's uh, we go all over the place. But I guess my question is, t- so two things. One, what complicates it is we literally start the movie with Cherry Berry or whatever the hell they're called. The Cherry, cherry Berries woods. and their <laughs> Cherry Woods and their children praying. Oh, were they praying? Yeah, which seems to imply that maybe there's a Christian theology as well here. That seems like it would just inherently conflict with the with the Care Bears and their theology. Wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe this is, I mean, that could be the underlying reason for why the book is the enemy. I mean, books represent knowledge. They represent the destruction of mythos over time. Yeah, the book is the apple that Adam and Eve eat from. Right, exactly. And so <laughs> you can work it in. My question is, if we have either Christianity and Care Bearology operating side by side or against each other, in the Care Bear theology hierarchy, who's God? Hmm, that is the question, I suppose. Maybe that will be answered in Care Bears too. <laughs> maybe that's what they're like. Maybe they're all like, have you ever heard of that? There's certain theories about god being uh, fractured into many pieces and maybe that's what the care bears are and then when they come together for the care bear stare like that's Mm. that's god's power like all of them together like that yeah like that's the jewish gnostic version of the divine body of adam being recorporated right there we go i think that's probably what they were going for probably i I think that's a safe bet yeah (laughs) yeah Um, yeah which brings up another interesting question how do you stare with your stomach that, yeah, yeah, I noticed that. I never questioned that as a child, but when I watched it now, I was like, how is this a stare? Yeah, although I, I guess it could be creepier if they were actually doing it with their eyes, because if their eyes start glowing and, like, shooting laser beams or whatever, I mean, that could be a little more intimidating than using their cutie marks or whatever. To, I suppose, to... but shouldn't it be, like, I don't know, Care Bear IBS or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I... I don't know. I mean, that's just that's just a little thought that I think should have. I mean, obviously it worked, right? I mean, um, uh, those toys back in the day made upwards of a hundred dollars a year. That could buy you a house back then. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Did you enjoy the cameo by the smoke monster from Lost? I did enjoy that. It was actually pretty when he it infected that tree. That was actually pretty cool. I I. I thought that was a great like action sequence and the the tree was evil and pretty much would have torn up all the Care Bears if it wasn't for that rabbit. Oh, and that rabbit, that Swift Heart the meth rabbit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that rabbit was maybe a little overpowered. Yeah, maybe a little bit. I, I was a big fan of Braveheart. I that was that was who I was following the whole time. I was I, I I'm kind of a grumpy bear on the outside, but a a, a brave heart on the inside, I, I like to think. Sadly, Braveheart's fucking useless throughout the entire movie. I love him, but he's he's so useless. I thought the best thing was the fact that their raincoats had the marks on them as well. They had, like, little rain ponchos that they put on, and they had the marks on them, because I guess, you know, without that mark, they're like, wait, who are you? I mean, they are a little difficult to tell apart. Oh, we also get a waterfall in this movie, yep, another movie waterfall with a waterfall scene. in it that kind of comes out of nowhere. Do you notice how most of the voice actors were Canadian? I didn't notice that. No, are they? I'm sorry. I care about you. Oh, I must have missed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That just, oh my God, that just jumps out at me so much and it drives me a little crazy. We get the term festival Cajun, which made me want to punch somebody. Mm. And sing along end credits, which is exciting. Yeah. Let me tell you the one thing that pissed me off the most about this, okay? Okay. And we'll we'll see how you feel about this. So there's this kind of, I, I don't want to call it subplot, there's this continuity point that's brought up where one of the bears gives 
uh, what's his name, Jason, a key. And he's like, hold on to this key. It's very important that we need it. We're going to need this to lock the book and end the fucking movie. Because if we don't lock this book, the demon can get out and, you know, the tree of knowledge can proliferate and our divine atom body will be useless and da 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 and all the usual stuff. So Jason takes the key and Jason keeps hold of the key until the very end. And, you know, and they're finally like, hey, give me the key. And Jason gives him the key. And the book, like, I don't know, zaps it or something. Somehow the key has gotten rid of. And I don't know, uh, key maker bear or whatever, just boops out another key. And he's like, okay, we'll use this one. And I'm like, well, what the fuck was the point of being like, Jason, you have to hold on to this key or we're all fucked well, for like half the movie. You could, I, it's very possible that it was like part of this intricate social engineering manipulation of Jason because their entire thing is to try to get him to to open up to them emotionally. So if they can make him feel important, you know, throughout the course of the movie, it doesn't matter whether they actually need the key or not, as long as they... He was already playing fucking leapfrog with him at that point. I think his social engineering bullshit was done. And if so, like, what a horrible way to fuck up your social engineering to be like, hey, that thing that I told you was your one meaning and and reason for existence, we didn't need it. (laughs) Anyway, have a good day. Yeah, but by that point he he didn't seem to mind. I I guess yeah yeah he was he was indoctrinated into the socialist compound by that point. Mm-hmm. And then he got new parents and it was all good. Yeah, that isn't having parents great. That was yeah, that I thought, line really... was it was I mean it was kind of strange <laughs> and kind of offensive to like the people with say like a single parent or. Right. Uh, you know, um, all the unaccompanied minors out there. But yeah, so overall, really good Gnostic tale, you know, really holds true to the Zarathustrian traditions of uh, the Platonic concepts uh, that Bentley Layton talks so much about, yeah. So I wish I'd taken more notes like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we need to do if we want to talk about that? Pokemon 3. Re- oh my god. Really? Legend of, or what is it? Legend of the Unknown or something of the unknown? Have you have you seen that movie? I think I have, but it, it must have been a long time ago. It is all about solipsism and the power of the will over reality. Dude, that sounds great. We would have to read some Kant to be able to take that movie on. I Let's do it. That sounds fun. I actually, funny story, saw that in the theater with a friend of mine whom I still know. At the time, we were either in or just out of college. She was very, very high. Oh. (laughs) And I kept whispering things like, holy shit, this is, you know, cons, blah, 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 blah. And she would scream, oh my God, you're right. (laughs) And all of the parents and their children would look at us very very strange and so it was a memorable experience i bet so if you could change one thing marisha to make this a better movie what would you change instead of changing nicholas good i would have had like some sort of transformation happen with the book itself either that or have the book take over the world and then they have to live in some sort of post-apocalyptic scenario that that they then have to reconvert the tree of knowledge book back in back into what it was always meant to be which is the divine salvation of everything so yeah yeah i would have gone (laughs) gone more in that direction (laughs) Like, the end isn't that they get Nicholas away from the book, but that they rewrite the book so that... Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, they, they reprogram it. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. I can dig that. For me, I, I just go with the way that I remember it. Braveheart sacrifices himself, uh, and his death spurs the others into the final act, um, or the final showdown, and they all have to kill Nicholas. Like, Nicholas is too far gone They have to murder him in cold blood (laughs) and live with what they've done, knowing that it was necessary to preserve society. Yeah, that would have been good material for this story. I I think so. You know, I think the kids would have liked it. I mean, it's like we already did the whole, like, were their parents dead or were they just grow disinterested? I mean, once you've crossed that line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, once you're that dark already, you might as well just go all the way. (laughs) That's right. That's, I think, enough for now. If you have any thoughts or feedback, disagree, agree, um, let us know. Info at iceonmars.net. Also, please be sure to rate and review, since that's how we make the big, big dollars. All right, everyone. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. Have a good one. (laughs) 
You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Thank <laughs> you.